Duskendale had been his finest hour, yet the memory tasted bitter on his tongue. The hour of the wolf, the blackest part of night, when all the world's asleep. He had first heard those words from Tywin Lannister outside the walls of Duskendale. He gave me a day to bring out Ares. Unless I returned with the king by dawn of the following day, he would take the town with steel and fire, he told me. It was the hour of the wolf when I went in, and the hour of the wolf when we emerged. These are the words of Barristan the Bold, remembering his famous rescue of Ares II after he was kidnapped by Lord Dennis Darkland. The defiance of Duskendale was a momentous event in the recent history of Westeros, taking place about 20 years before the start of the books. Most of you know the basics, but here's a summary. Duskendale had a grievance regarding restrictions and taxes, and they proposed some changes. Hand to the King Tywin said no. Lord Darkland, ruler of the town, protested by refusing to pay taxes, then invited the king to come in person to discuss the issue. Tywin strongly advised against this, but Ares was in that phase where he frequently did the opposite of whatever Tywin advised or ruled, and off he went. It was a trap. They kidnapped him to use as leverage for their original grievance. Tywin showed up with the army and acted like Tywin does. Give back the king and surrender or the town is annihilated. A return threat was issued. Do that and the king dies. Tywin's response to that was essentially, then you'll all be dead and Rhaegar will be king instead. So Rhaegar instead of Ares? Well, that turned Duskendale's threat into something of a benefit. That caused a bit of a stalemate. In comes Barristan Selmy asking permission to break the stalemate, sneak in, take care of it all on his own. On his own! Tywin isn't known for being a fun guy, but this kind of entertainment was too much to pass up on. He gave the White Knight one day, then sat back to watch Taken 3, The Mad King, starring Barristan Selmium Neeson. The songs of Sir Barristan's daring rescue of the king are many, and for a rarity, the singers hardly had to embroider it. Sir Barristan did indeed scale the walls unseen in the dark of night, using nothing but his bare hands, and he did disguise himself as a hooded beggar as he made his way to the Dunfort. It is true as well that he managed to scale the walls of the Dunfort in turn, killing a guard on the wall walk before he could raise the alarm. Then, by stealth and courage, he found his way to the dungeon where the king was being kept. By the time he had Aerys Targaryen out of the dungeon, however, the king's absence had been noted, and the hue and cry went up. And then, the true breadth of Sir Barristan's heroism was revealed, for he stood and fought, rather than surrender himself or his king. And not only did he fight, but he struck first, taking Lord Darkland's good brother and master-at-arms, Sir Simon Hollard, and a pair of guards unawares, slaying them all, and so avenging the death of his sworn brother, Sir Gawain Gaunt of the King's Guard, who had been killed at Hollard's hand. He hurried with the king to the stables, fighting his way through those who tried to intervene, and the two were able to ride out of the Dunfort before the castle's gates could be closed. Then there was the wild ride through the streets of Duskendale, while horns and trumpets sounded the alarm, and the race up the walls as Lord Tywin's archers attempted to clear it of defenders. It's a fantastic twist on the solo rescue trope. Normally, the hero saves their child or romantic partner or popular political or royal person, more likely to be a happy princess than a mad king. Here, there's no triumphant ending or happily ever after. Instead, it's a never-ending what-if for the hero. As he says himself in the quote, his finest hour turned bitter. A conflicted action hero is nothing new. That part is common enough, but the conflict revolving around the actual heroism, that's a bit different. Though he's the star of the defiance of Duskendale, he's only a small part of the analysis, though. If we had to pick a main character for this episode, it's not him. The king he saved didn't go on to rule well or even poorly. It was worse than that. He reigned terribly from this point forward, it is widely believed that Ares was at his worst after Duskendale, until his death about six years later at the hands of another king's guard, another future Lord Commander, the son of the Hand of the King, at this point in history. Of course, that's Jamie Lannister. But it might not be Ares either. It might be Tywin. With Ares in captivity, he was de facto in charge of everything. And frankly, even when Ares wasn't in prison, a lot of people kind of saw it as Tywin was already the most powerful man in the kingdom. He was already running things somewhat. 
When you reach the end of this episode, well, you can decide who the main character is if you so desire. Beyond that, the aftermath of Duskendale led to further momentous events that we all know pretty well, at least we understand them and realize they were important, like the death of Stefan Baratheon and the coming of Varys the Spider. And it deepened the mistrust Ares felt towards Tywin and Rhaegar, which was already present, now worse. And it coincided with Ares' attempts to hatch dragon eggs and his interest in wildfire. Hello, my fellow historians. I'm Aziz. With me is Ashea, and this is The Defiance of Duskendale. This episode is divided into four parts, in addition to an intro and an outro, of course. We have The Darklands of Duskendale, The Defiance of Duskendale, Double Dealing Duskendale, and From Dawn Till Duskendale. Let's thank our patrons who make this show possible. We are eternally grateful for the financial support that allows us to continue operating at maximum capacity. If you want to join and become one of the supporters, go to historyofwesteros.com and click on the Patreon link or one of the other links that enables you to support History of Westeros that aren't Patreon. But Patreon is the main one. Thanks to Jeff Gnarly, the long snapper, History of Westeros' first sword, and Talanis the Talon, King of Gagasos, Rider of Talarius, a red dragon with scales, horns, and talons of Midnight Black. Hunter of House Black Cloud is the Storm Runner, King of the Sky, Rider of Heranicon, the Windworm, a dragon with scales of brilliant platinum silver, horns, claws, and fangs of pure white with eyes the color of diamonds of fire. Let's begin with a brief history of our subject location and the house ruling it. The Darklands of Duskendale. The large and prosperous harbor town of Duskendale has been ruled by House Darkland since the times of the first men in the Age of Heroes. And it gives us a lot of great tales. And a pattern slash theme or two. The Darkland kings of old exuded control over their neighbors as far as Crackclaw Point and the mouth of the Blackwater. But this control was inconsistent. Their chief vassal was House Hollard, who went extinct during A Song of Ice and Fire when Littlefinger had the last one murdered. But it was the Mad King who reduced them to a single Sir Dantost-sized house a generation prior. Though they never forged the area into a unified kingdom, nor were they conquered by any of the great powers around them, at least nothing that lasted for long, keep in mind that in those times, there was no King's Landing, nor even a White Harbor. Gulltown was likely their chief rival, but there's no indication that it was anything more than competitive, and surely the two traded with each other quite a lot. When the Andals came, the Darklands played the game like many other First Men houses and married rather than fought the invaders. And for their part, like so many Andals, the newcomers gave up their old names so as to maintain stability among the small folk. So House Darkland adapted with the times. Different people, still House Darkland, shared cultural heritage, uniting the prosperity of their town. With the Vale united under the great power of the Aarons, Gulltown gained the status of city as its population grew. Duskendale never did grow quite as large, though it seemed to still have status equal to or greater than Gulltown. This despite the advantages of being backed by the much more powerful House Aaron, and they were also staying ahead of newcomers like Driftmark, who likely changed the landscape of the region when they moved in alongside House Targaryen in advance of the Doom. The Valarian Isle grew to become a center of trade as well, giving them another port to compete with. Another rival with the backing of a great power, too. The Falcons and Dragons had moved in. So Duskendale had surely been dealing with the Targaryens and the Valarians and Celtigars of Claw Isle for the century or so before the conquest, if not longer. Perhaps the Valyrian traders who occupied the Isle of Dragonstone before the Targaryens and the Doom were someone they dealt with as well. About 340 to 360 years before Song of Ice and Fire, another great power came knocking from the west. And it wasn't House Lannister. It was King Halleck of House Hor, son of Harwin Hardhand, who had founded the Kingdom of the Isles and Rivers. It was King Halleck who added Rosby and Duskendale to that new kingdom. No doubt Duskendale paid heavily like the rest when King Halleck's son Heron the Black began the construction of Harrenhal. He abused his kingdom for 40 years in the completion of the project. The lands closer to the great castles suffered the most, it seems, but surely the rich port felt the strain of King Heron's cruel demands. However, the port was still rich under him, we hear, and may have adapted under his rule like they had to prior conquerors. Because unlike many under Heron the Black, they were actually loyal to their king when put to what was probably their first major test. 
Though history actually calls it Aegon's first test because it was the first conflict of the conquest. Lord Darklin and Lord Mouton of Maidenpool led an army to oppose Aegon when he landed and claimed the mouth of Blackwater. And then soon after, Aegon began construction of the Aegon Fort. Opposing him didn't go well because, well, Aegon had Valerian and both of the lords were slain. The new lords of Mouton and Darklin surrendered. Queen Visenya went to accept their submission. At that time, Duskendale was the principal Westerosi port on the Narrow Sea and had grown fat and wealthy from the trade that passed through its harbour. Visenya Targaryen did not allow the town to be sacked, but she did not hesitate to claim its riches, greatly swelling the coffers of the conquerors. Now that's really saying something. Duskendale was clearly a greater power than it is now, but to hear that they were richer than even Gulltown and other places like Maidenpool and all the others we just named, Driftmark, White Harbor, who, who was around by then? That's surprising and very interesting. It's not said, but perhaps implied that this wealth Visenya seized was not unlikely a big part of why they would have been next on the Targaryen list anyway. If they hadn't ridden forth to give battle to Aegon, he probably would have come to them. So either way, they're probably going to lose. So maybe that's pragmatic honor, right? Facing what you're going to face eventually. But it still takes courage to face a dragon. They could have just bent the knee right away. And ultimately, it was only a setback for the house speaking on a large scale. Obviously, their lord died, and that was a big deal at the time, most likely. But they kept control of Duskendale. The Darkland control maintained, and that's probably more important in the long run. And it maintained its place as a prominent trade port on the Narrow Sea. In fact, maybe there was some optimism. Maybe there was hope that the new regime would be better for them. More stability. And if more stability is happening, then that might be more trade. But then, Hagan the Conqueror built King's Landing. It would pretty quickly become the biggest city in all of Westeros, easily growing much larger in population and trade and esteem than Duskendale. And it's very close by. Despite this, the Darklands again handled the transition well. Sure, they were overshadowed by a few other locales now, but they were still sitting pretty overall, and they looked to opportunities to advance within the new regime. The Darklands made at least one marriage with the Manderleys, and trade with other parts of the realm were likely expanded. But more importantly, they grew close to the crown as part of the newly created crown lands. And as part of the King's Guard, this is very notable for House Darklin. Sir Robin Darklin, a.k.a. Dark Robin, being one of the first founding members. It was Visenya who created the White Cloaks, don't forget, and she insisted on loyalty more so than anything. So while we don't know much about Dark Robin, we know he convinced Visenya of that much, that he was loyal, that he could be counted on, in addition to whatever prowess he probably had as a fighter. Six other men from House Darkland would follow in Sir Robin's footsteps over the years, making them number one all time in that regard, meaning no house in all of Westeros can claim to have as many King's Guard as House Darkland ever. This would obviously be a point of pride for them, I would think, so, so much so that it is a part of their sigil now. So at some point it was changed. Seven white shields can be seen. I would love to see an eighth added retroactively for John Keel Dark the bastard daughter of Lord Darklin, who rose to be the sworn shield of good Queen Alysanne. Another Darklin was named by Aegon III in his minority, but that was reversed by the regent, Lord Unwin Peak. So that one maybe doesn't count. That shows us how loyalty to House Targaryen can be tricky, especially when the dragon has two heads, and those two heads bite each other. Hm. Duskendale stayed loyal to Magor, likely because of their loyalty to Visenya, his mom, that probably played a role. And this even when Magor's reign was going badly. When Magor was finally found dead on the Iron Throne, though, that was clearly the end, and it was Lord Darklin, along with two other lords, who led the surrender of the Red Keep to Jaehaerys and Alysanne. This lord may have been the same one that was John Keel Dark's father. He was pardoned shortly thereafter. Another of the Darkland King's Guard was Sir Stefan, who stayed loyal to the Blacks of Queen Rhaenyra. He became Lord Commander, but died trying to ride the dragon sea smoke. That he tried may hint at intermarrying between Darkland and Targaryen or Velaryon at some point, but failing and dying 
<laughs> to ride a dragon doesn't actually aid that theory at all. So maybe not. Again, Driftmark got the better of the Darklands when Adam Valarian succeeded in keeping the dragon sea smoke with his house. Gunthor Darklin was Lord of Duskendale and nephew to Sir Stefan, and he sat on the Black Council alongside Adam's father, the Sea Snake, along with some other luminaries. But when Sir Kristen Cole was named Hand in place of Otto Hightower very early in the war for the Greens, the first thing he did was take Duskendale. It was sacked horribly. The harbor was burned, and Lord Gunthor lost his head. I doubt it was much consolation for them that Driftmark's port city and castle were also burned, and Sir Adam was killed, and so was Sea Smoke. That probably didn't make them feel any better. King's Landing didn't exactly fare very well during the dance either, so it was really just everyone was taking it on the chin. As a result of the chaos in the capital, Queen Rhaenyra fled and found shelter briefly at Duskendale. So when things were at their worst for her, as they had been for so many other kings, the Darklands stuck with her, despite what had just happened. I mean, their city had just been sacked, yet they maintained their loyalty. But not long after that, Rhaenyra was dead. Uh, luckily for Duskendale, though, they didn't suffer any further reprisals. When the war ended, Duskendale and King's Landing and the rest began the recovery process. Not long after that, the dragons died out, but the Darklands continued to stay loyal. We see them again accompanying Lord Bloodraven in squashing the second Blackfire Rebellion before it really got going. The Defiance of Duskendale. This long history of loyalty and steadfastness and record-setting Kingsguard appearances were perhaps a large reason why the Darklands maybe felt entitled to a bit more. Not to mention all these locations were thriving. Why not grow even larger? Well, it seems that while Duskendale was still a wealthy port, every year King's Landing got bigger, and that took a toll. Once the most important port on Blackwater Bay, the town had seen its trade dwindle and its wealth shrink as King's Landing grew and burgeoned, a decline that its young lord, Dennis Darklin, wished to halt. In the past, it was a matter of free market competition, but under the Iron Throne, the town of Duskendale, like almost every other town in the entirety of Westeros, was limited in size by law. He had to have approval to grow larger. Limiting their size limited their power, but also their wealth. The number of ships and traders and market goers is capped. King's Landing can grow as big as it wants, but Duskendale can't? That's how it is, huh? Hmm. Yeah, that's how it was. And the tax situation was out of balance as well. Apparently, on top of the restrictions and growth, they also had some extra fees to pay that King's Landing didn't. Some of this isn't entirely clear, but it sounds like maybe they had a legitimate grievance. Doesn't it seem like they'd earned a little regard over the years, too? This could be seen as lack of trust towards a vassal who had proven themselves over and over. You can see why this might be a slight. With no betrayals of note in their record either. A long history that's pretty spotless in terms of staying loyal to the king. So I think we can begin to see why the Darklands were feeling a little mistreated. It was Lord Dennis's desire to win a charter for Duskendale that would give it more autonomy from the crown, much as had been done for Dawn many years before, that began the trouble. This did not seem to him such a vast demand. Such charters were common across the narrow sea, as Lady Sarala most certainly had told him. Yet it was understandable that Lord Tywin, as Hand, firmly rejected his proposals, for fear it might set a dangerous precedent. What precedent would it set? There's a strong argument to be made that allowing the crown lands to grow was wise policy for the crown since it was their territory they directly taxed that would benefit indirectly from that. Talon was worried about having a powerful neighbor, but if that powerful neighbor is loyal, then that's a good thing. That would discourage other people from trying to come in. Clearly, Tywin didn't see it that way. Or maybe he did and opposed it for cynical reasons, self-serving reasons. Maybe he saw Duskendale as a threat to the ambitions of House Lannister for some reason. In general, Tywin was a man who believed in keeping power concentrated at the top, while also working his way towards that top for himself. Ares had refused Tywin's offer of Rhaegar and Cersei not long before this, but the prince was still unmarried. So Tywin hadn't given up on that. So if the king were to die, well, Rhaegar could marry Ares as he pleased. He could make that choice himself. In other words, just because Ares refused the offer of Cersei doesn't mean Rhaegar will. Hmm. 
Furthermore, Tywin was generous with money, but not with power. He wasn't about to surrender crown authority when he expected his own family would soon be the ones wielding said crown authority. So Tywin Lannister handed the king, denied the requested charter. Infuriated at the refusal, Lord Darklin then devised a new plan to win his charter, and with it, lower port fees and tariffs to allow Duskendale once more to vie for trade with King's Landing, a plan that was pure folly. The defiance of Duskendale began quietly enough. Lord Dennis, seeing that Aerie's erratic behaviour had begun to strain his relations with Lord Tywin, refused to pay the taxes expected of him, and instead invited the king to come to Duskendale and hear his petition. At that point, they would take him captive. This lure of the king to Duskendale might be the only clever part of all of this, and might indicate the planning included more plotters than is apparent. Maybe. On the surface, it might seem odd they could even expect to get the king to come. But relations between Tywin and Ares were very strained by this point. It had become a bit of a pattern that Ares would sometimes reverse Tywin's decisions, right? In order to undermine him. This was as much to embarrass him than as it was to do anything else. Ares' jealousy and overall issues with Tywin were no secret. We've been over that before. These reversals may have been common enough so as to have been predictable. At this point, it might have been like, oh, well, here comes another reversal. In A Game of Thrones, Ned and Varys discuss the outburst between Cersei and Robert when the king yells at her that if he wants to fight in the melee, he'll fight in the melee. Ned doesn't catch it at first, but Varys says... She forbade him to fight in front of his brother, his knights, and half the court. Tell me truly, do you know any surer way to force King Robert into the melee? I ask you. Ned had a sick feeling in his gut. The eunuch had hit upon a truth. Tell Robert Baratheon he could not, should not, or must not do a thing, and it was as good as done. In other words, classic reverse psychology from Cersei there. Robert was easy to predict when it came to such things. Ares seemed predictable in his own way, too. It's certainly similar enough here in the case of Duskendale. It seems most unlikely that King Ares would ever have considered accepting this invitation until Lord Tywin advised him to refuse in the strongest possible terms, whereupon the king decided to accept, informing Grand Maester Pycelle and the small council that he meant to settle this matter himself and bring the defiant Darklin to heel. This is where we have to ask a few questions. Ned realized how obvious the reverse psychology was when pointed out to him. Now, isn't that possibility pretty strong here, too? Especially from Cersei's father. Tywin has a history of double dealing and scapegoating. He talks about the injustice of the deaths of Elia's children, for example, despite it being his men and probably his orders. He deals with the Westerlings when he has them betray Rob and their own daughter Jane via the Red Wedding, but Tywin doesn't tell the Westerlings that there's going to be a massacre at the wedding. That party left out, and Reynald Westerling is killed there. He also seems to have promised his niece Joy Hill to two different families. He's also no dummy. Tywin didn't just advise him to refuse, he advised him to refuse in, quote, the strongest possible terms. And he did it in front of the small council. I submit that very possibly this was a case of reverse psychology. By loudly telling Ares not to go, he all but assured he would. And there was no Varys around to make this observation. If Tywin was using reverse psychology here when telling Ares not to go to Duskendale, the flip side would be, oh, yes, your grace, I do recommend going to Duskendale. He's just not going to say that, even if he thinks it's the right play, perhaps, because it's just a high-risk low-reward situation. Nothing can go well for Tywin by the Mad King going to Duskendale. Either he agrees to reverse Tywin's decrees, or something worse happens, like this. Basically, there's nothing good for Tywin about suggesting that. So you can say, yes, on risk aversion alone, Tywin was sincere. Because yes, it probably was a bad idea, even without the potential of kidnapping. But... Mm, I think the possibility that he was in cahoots with the Dark Ones is pretty low, but it is something to consider. Because Lord Tywin can be sincere and state in the obvious, which gives him plausible deniability, while still being able to see where all this is headed. He can predict the predictable, right? So I also believe he was prepared to take full advantage of whatever happened. 
just he needed to make sure he had himself covered on accusations and, you know, all that stuff. So I think it piqued his ambition here. I think he was ready to do anything he could to get Ares's blood on someone else's hands. He didn't want him on his. And he would have gotten away with it too if not for that meddling Selmy. As for the plan, no matter who pushed or originated it, it was Lord Darkland's call in the end. If he says so, none of this happens. But he said yes. Against Lord Tywin's advice, the king travelled to Duskendale with a small escort led by Sir Gwyn Gaunt of the Kingsguard. The invitation proved to be a trap, however, and one that the Targaryen king walked into blindly. He was seized with his escort, and some of the men, most notably Sir Gwyn, were killed while attempting to defend their king. Right away, something has gone wrong with the plan. Or if this was the plan, right away, you can see that the plan was bad. Kidnapping the king is unlikely to be forgiven. It's one of the reasons this plan was doomed from the start, but at least it's possible that they could be forgiven or reach some kind of accord. One could argue that no harm was really done if no one's killed, but a dead king's guard is a they've crossed a line. Not to mention they killed a few other people, apparently. That very small out they had to be forgiven, just it's a definitive no after that point, I think. They're just supposed to respect the institution of Kingsguard, too. This is the house that had the most Kingsguard. So this is just uh, not a good play. So Sir Gawain Gaunt, that's the name of that Kingsguard. His death is also going to be part of Barristan's motivation. That was his sworn brother. And he takes that very seriously, Barristan does. And the last thing any plan needs is a provision that includes pitting your side against whatever side Barristan Selmy is on. You just don't want him as an enemy. Double dealing Duskendale. Would you rather be eaten by a lion or by a dragon? Hmm. The Defiance was the kind of bad idea that makes everyone around wonder how it was ever put into action in the first place. Whether or not their grievance was legitimate, and from where I'm sitting, it probably was, there's no good reason to think this plan was going to work. So, why? Perhaps it was this long history of loyalty, of not switching sides until the death of the one they'd sworn to that led them to have these additional expectations or additional bitterness over the rejection. Perhaps seeing Driftmark and Galtown and King's Landing all surpass them in wealth despite their greater contributions and loyalty and service, seen as a snub. Been over that before, but we got to keep these things straight. The most popular speculation seems to be that the idea and a fair measure of the indignance and pride that catalyzed these efforts came from Lord Darkland's wife, Sarala of Mir. Her detractors blame her entirely for what transpired. The Lace Serpent, as they name her, poisoned Lord Darkland against the king with her pillow talk. Her defenders insist that the folly lay with Lord Dennis himself. His wife is hated simply because she was a woman of foreign birth who prayed to gods alien to Westeros. Now, let's be clear, there's no good way to determine the truth here, just like it would be in real history. You never know whose idea things are in the real world. People, when things go well, other people tend to grab credit, and when they don't, people tend to slough the blame. So historians often don't know what to record as far as the origination. We can only record what they know, what actually happens. And in this case, a lot would hinge on what kind of reputation Lady Sorrell had before all this. Was she the lace serpent prior to the defiance of Duskendale, or was that a nickname hung on her during this? Because if it, she already had that nickname, then maybe that implies she was already a schemer or something. But even if she was involved deeply in the plotting here, it's pretty clear that we can see some scapegoating and a lot of assumptions. When Brienne is at Duskendale, she learns that the locals were used to the Darklands marrying other noble houses like the nearby Rosbys, Stauntons, Stokeworths, etc. The locals, 22 to 23 years later, still maintain to this day that Lord Dennis would have been fine had he married one of those houses instead of Lady Sorella. Now, this goes back a long way, this, this attitude. Remember that when the Andals came, they kept the name Darkland because the name Darkland is associated with all this good and with stability. So you can kind of see that same attitude in place here. Oh, it's the foreigner that changed things. The foreign influence is why things are different, and that's why it's bad. Well, in that case, we should ask, why did he marry her in the first place? Quite often with a lord marrying outside the realm, the reason is financial. 
it is somewhat understood that marrying into the nobility is expensive. You got to pay a large dowry. So I think that's entirely what's in play here uh, as a possibility that as part of the decline of Duskendale, Lord Dennis was like, well, if I get this huge dowry by marrying this Mirish lady, well, that, that'll help us out a bit with our lost income. Certainly the notion of a free city, like the nine free cities, sounds a bit similar to this charter they were asking for. Now, I don't know for sure that they were asking for a legal structure similar to one of the free cities or the a Westeros equivalent of that. But it sounds kind of like that's what it was. It's hinted at that in the sources. And that's an associate cultural thing. So that's part of why her influence is divined here. Or was it something during Ares' captivity, though? Maybe something personal happened. After all, Ares did not give off the impression he was very forgiving when it came to insults. Maybe she was just rude to him, like re- repeatedly rude. With Ares, it's just hard to tell. If we add all that up, there's a lot of unknowns, and in using our imaginations, we find so many possibilities. But for whatever reasons, Lady Sorella re- received the harshest punishment of all, arguably, after this was all done. Certainly harsher than Lord Darklin himself. Again, sometimes these ancient families get off lighter just because of their blood, but maybe it was something personal. The challenge here is for us to accept that not knowing is a valid state to leave certain questions. With insufficient evidence, that's the right thing to do. We just say we don't know. The question might not even be framed properly. For example, it seems like they're trying to pin the blame on one or the other, either Lady Sorala or Lord Darklin, but why not both? It's probably not neither, (laughs) but perhaps they were equal partners in the plan, devising it together. And and maybe they had advisors or not. All this is unclear. But maybe there was outside influence. If Tywin was using reverse psychology earlier when we brought that up, then maybe there was double dealing here. Maybe he promised them something like he promised the Westerlings in the phrase if they do this dirty job for him, well, he'll pardon them and make it okay. It'll be worth it. It's kind of like how he let the phrase take the fall for the Red Wedding. And we didn't see the full fallout of that because he died before that could all play out. But upon his death, Cersei's ready to throw the phrase under the bus too. Speaking of Cersei, this is reminiscent of what she wanted Osney Kettleblack to do, which was go to the wall, kill Jon Snow, then get pardoned. It fits nicely even more if you think of Jon as a king here, uh, not to mention that he's... Ares' grandson, that would help explain, too, why this plan seems so audacious. If the Darklands had arranged for a pardon in advance, well, all of a sudden, kidnapping the king is a lot less wild. Clearly, they didn't get that pardon, but also Ares wasn't killed. That may have been part of what the plan hinged on. Regardless, while I think many of these angles were visible to various lords and ladies and plotters and schemers, no one without supernatural access or means could have foreseen Barrist and Selmy coming forward to do what he did, let alone succeeding. So plotting aside, let's not forget Occam's razor and look at the simplest idea. There's no reason to set aside the possibility that these aren't just young, dumb nobles, full of big ideas, but lacking in wisdom. No conspiracy necessary to explain that. But we like to be thorough and examine all the possibilities as we see them. Now, we don't know Sorala's age, but Lord Darklin was said to be young, so good chance she was too. Turns out you would rather be eaten by the lion than the dragon. I asked that question earlier, and well, we do have an answer. It wasn't meant to be a, well, does it matter type answer. It actually does matter in this case. The dragon burns you alive first. Well, at least this one does. And that sounds a lot worse. I would rather just be eaten without the burning part. Now, when you put yourself in a situation where Tywin Lannister's wrath is the softer choice, you've definitely gone wrong. And that's why I bring up their ages here. Tywin had been through all this before, see? About 16 years prior, there was this Rain Tarbeck Rebellion, the Reigns of Castamir. You may have heard of that. And that started over money as well. Money and pride, as these things often are linked, especially with these noble houses. Tywin called in the loans that his father had given to a lot of the vassals. But led by Lord Roger Rain, many refused to pay. In part because Tywin was still just the heir. He wasn't the lord. They were challenging his authority to make such a declaration. Walder and Tarbeck went to Casterly Rock to convince Lord Tychos to 
reverse his son's edicts. But Tywin was like, no, you're going to prison. So he threw him in prison. It, it's pretty similar to Ares showing up, wanting to negotiate, and just, nope, prison for you. So you can see a lot of parallels here. So when I say Tywin has been through this before, it's even more on the nose than you might think. Now, fast forward to the end of the Reigns of Castamere situation when the Tarbecks are already gone and the last of the Reigns are hiding down in the mines of Castamere with Tywin refusing to negotiate, intent on flooding them all to death, which he does. In this case, it sounds like Tywin would have stormed the town of Duskendale right away if he could have, but it wasn't really possible. It's a much more formidable place than Castamere. Before he could even consider an attack on Duskendale, his men would need time to build siege towers and ladders or battering ram, whatever they needed, and probably they needed more men, so they would have had to wait for that to arrive. Duskendale was surrounded by strong walls, and the Dunfort, the ancient seat of House Darklin, which overlooked the harbour, was even more formidable. Taking it by storm would be no easy task. Lord Tywin thus sent out riders and ravens, gathering forces while commanding the Darklands to give up the king. Lord Dennis instead sent word that if any attempt was made to break his walls, he would put his grace to death. Some in the small council questioned this, declaring that no son of Westeros would ever dare to commit such a heinous crime. But Lord Tywin would not chance it. Instead, with a sizable host, he moved to surround Duskendale, blockading it by land and by sea. With a royal host massed outside of his walls and his supply chain cut off, Lord Darkland's determination began to falter. He made several efforts to parley, but Lord Tywin refused to hear him, instead repeating his demand for the complete and unconditional surrender of the town and castle and the release of the king. No parley at all. Interesting. Well, again, not surprising for Tywin to take a hardline stance, but is this really the best way to ensure the life of the king? This sounds like Tywin's honor and pride in his way of doing things, but not the route you take to make sure Ares' life is saved, right? It seems like his goal is a little different. Tywin teaches Joffrey that a defeated enemy must be punished, but ultimately pardoned when they bend the knee, or they will have no incentive to bend the knee. They may as well fight to the death, right? You got to give them a lifeline. But unconditional surrender in this case is death. This is Ares we're talking about. Again, Though he wasn't yet at his worst, he was in decline and he was already very violent. He had plenty of people beheaded who were almost certainly innocent. Surrendering to Tywin, as we said, would have been bad enough, but if Ares lives, it's not Tywin's call. Ares makes all the decisions. Tywin's mercy or lack thereof is irrelevant. It's all about what Ares wants and, well, we know what Ares wants. <laughs> and here's evidence that it would have been worse and this is also evidence that these Darklands were a real clown show, as Brienne hears from the maester at the Dunfort that Robin Hollard was also a squire, and when the king was seized, he danced around him and pulled his beard. That is just really, wow, you just, man. We, either, we hear of other minor abuses like that, but that just blows my mind that someone would do that to someone with his reputation. I mean, that's bold. Near suicidal, but not like Barristan the Bold's near suicidal rescue because Barristan had a purpose. What good did it do to torment the king? Like that, there's no benefit there. If they were truly this naive, well, that's what I'm getting at when I say maybe this really was just a clown show. So who knows if they ever really figured out how doomed they were. But perhaps it finally dawned on them that they were kind of hopeless here, caught between a casterly rock and a targ place. If they realized Tywin was willing to let them kill Ares, then who knows what justice they'd face for that. But if, again, they didn't kill Ares, their death was even more certain because, of course, Ares is going to order that and he might make it really painful. Either way, the Dunfort is done for. Tywin had surely figured out all of this too. He understood the Darklands' position, Ares' position, and his own position because he's smart and because the siege lasted a while, he had plenty of time to think about it. He may have figured it all out before even the Dark Ones did. But there were other voices present as well. This wasn't just Ares, Tywin, and the Dark Ones. This was a lot of people. Most of the small council were with the Hand outside Duskendale at this juncture, and several of them argued against Lord Tywin's plan on the grounds that such an attack would almost certainly goad Lord Darklin into putting King Ares to death. He may... Well, he may not. 
Tywin Lannister reportedly replied, but if he does, we have a better king right here, whereupon he raised a hand to indicate Prince Rhaegar. Scholars have debated ever since as to Lord Tywin's intent. Did he believe Lord Darklyn would back down, or was he in truth willing and perhaps even eager to see Aerys die so that Prince Rhaegar might take the Iron Throne? Interestingly, Rhaegar's own thoughts are not mentioned in the sources here. What did he think of Tywin's intentions? What did the Kingsguard think of Tywin's intentions? Because if they saw which way the wind was blowing and that Ares was going to be killed if Tywin sacked the town, well, well, the Kingsguard are supposed to stop the death of the king. So they would probably argue against Tywin storming the town. But of course, they don't really have enough authority to stop him. Still, I would think they'd be opposed to his plan. Maybe not, though. The Lord Commander at the time was... Sir Gerald Hightower, the White Bull, and, well, that guy was more on Rhaegar's side than Ares's, as far as we can tell. He was one of the ones that showed up at the Tower of Joy, or at least was there at the Tower of Joy when Ned showed up. Overall, most of the characters' motivations are unclear here. Rhaegar is later portrayed as not indifferent, perhaps, but disinterested or distracted from ruling the realm. He had his mind on other things. On the other hand, we know for certain that Tywin was constantly suffering under Ares's petty jealousy, and more importantly, Ares had stymied his plans for that royal marriage to Cersei and Rhaegar. I feel strongly that Tywin cared far more about that than any of these other matters, or anything else you can think of by a wide margin. He had his eyes on the prize. Safe bet, then, that he surely wished Barristan would fail. When Barristan came riding out with the king, Tywin's probably thinking to himself, you have got to be kidding me. He was only a day away from helping King Rhaegar replace Selmy in his new Kingsguard, which would be short one given the expected failure. <laughs> I'm sure he wasn't thinking of naming Jamie, though, one of the many things that went wrong for Tywin after Barristan's misguided heroism here. But let's not pin all of this on Tywin either. In my opinion, many lords shared Tywin's wishes that it would be better if Rhaegar were king. If Ares were gone, that would be an improvement. Of course, they wouldn't want to say that out loud or even whisper it, given the paranoia of Ares, which still, again, hadn't peaked. They would be even less likely to say it after Duskendale. This is too straightforward for it not to have been an opinion shared by many others. It's just so obvious. They're like, well, Rhaegar's king. Hmm, yeah, that probably would be better. And that's part of the point, because the realm was troubled anyway. Even working with Ares on mundane issues was a challenge and a risk. You could just be like, hey, Ares, can we do this one little thing? He's like, are you threatening me? <laughs> Wait, no. <laughs> of course, no. That said, this would not be the opinion of everyone. There are many who would prefer Ares because they see profit or opportunity under a chaotic, unpredictable rule. Such types always exist. Some people prefer to manipulate the dangerous king and point him towards their enemies or they think they can handle it or manage him. Chaos is good for some people. We know that. Others still, though, would see Tywin Lannister effectively ruling the realm as a very bad outcome, worse than Ares. It might be hard to imagine, but you can see how Tywin might be worse in the long term. He's not going to just randomly execute people or lose his temper over nothing. But if he's just calculatingly, cunningly moving so much of the power to his own house and himself and breaking traditions, as we've seen him do in A Song of Ice and Fire, so many other things, I don't think it's that hard to imagine that a lot of lords would rather have Ares. Because at least Ares will lead to Rhaegar, and then Rhaegar can rule alone without Tywin you know, having his hand up his shirt, trying to rule him like a puppet. I mean, some people would look at this and say, okay, Ares has had a few people killed. So Tywin wiped out the reins in Tarbex. A few extra deaths is nothing compared to a few extra houses wiped out. So just got to keep in mind where things lay at the time. Yes, Ares was bad, but the worst of Ares was yet to come. Tywin already had this stuff on his reputation already. Now, after Duskendale, well, then Ares now, he also has wiped out some houses, so that's no longer a differentiation. Now the whole of the nobility, perhaps the entire realm, instead of just Duskendale, is caught between Casterly Rock and the Targ place. 
And going forward, yes, it became a lot harder to stay clear of Aries's paranoia. It got harder. His paranoia peaked and became, I don't know, three, five, ten times worse. It's almost as if grand displays of loyalty were necessary to keep yourself on his good side. Well, one man's display was particularly so. It was particularly bold. From dawn till Duskendale. We've considered the motivations for everyone except perhaps the hero himself. We started the episode with him and haven't said much about him since. But like we do with the question of the plot by the Darklands, with Barristan, there's a simple version and a more complex version. The simple version is that Barristan is a knight's knight. He figured he might be able to pull it off, so he should try because it's his duty. If the king is about to die, he has to try. That's being a king's guard. Letter of the law, letter of the rules. That's Barristan. The complex version is to ask ourselves if he craved glory or recognition or acceptance. Not to necessarily judge him for it, just to be curious, to ask ourselves what's what. I mean, that would be a minor criticism if it was a criticism at all. But this is a human conflict that we're dealing with. It's very compelling and interesting. Barristan thinks too how he was never personally that close with Rhaegar. Well, if you're Rhaegar and you see this kind of ultra loyalty to your father, well, as factions divided between Rhaegar and Ares, it may have looked like Barristan was a loyalist for his father. So I can see why Rhaegar would be like, maybe that guy isn't someone I need in my inner circle. After all, Barristan was probably less morally flexible when he was young. He's not exactly morally flexible now, maybe more so than some Kingsguard. But you wouldn't call him morally flexible compared to, say, the average Westerosi, especially the average Westerosi noble. So this would maybe explain why at the time he didn't follow Tywin's lead. He wasn't thinking about the politics at all. He wasn't thinking about the fallout of saving Ares. He didn't know Ares would get worse. He's just doing his duty. Either way, regardless of his motivations, it is definitely clear just how gifted this guy is slash was. We get a lot from other sources about this event. Himself, he doesn't talk about it much. Consider how many similar elements are in his escape from King's Landing after being stripped of his cloak by Cersei and Joffrey, though. It's quite similar. There's a lot of very similar pieces to it. Recall what happens there. He gets angry, throws his sword at the foot of the throne, then Joffrey becomes angry back and Jano Slint sends gold cloaks after him. He gets past them easily. Then he has to get a horse, ride out through the gates while still being chased. He describes this all to Danny and compare this story to what actually happens at Duskendale. And you without your sword? How did you get past them? A true knight is worth ten guardsmen. The men at the gate were taken by surprise. I rode one down, wrenched away his spear, and drove it through the throat of my closest pursuer. The other broke off once I was through the gate, so I spurred my horse to a gallop and rode hell-bent along the river until the city was lost to sight behind me. That night I traded my horse for a handful of pennies and some rags, and the next morning I joined the stream of small folk making their way to King's Landing. I'd gone out the mud gate, so I returned through the gate of the gods with dirt on my face, stubble on my cheeks, and no weapon but a wooden staff. Still dressed as a beggar, he witnesses the new king execute Ned Stark. At Duskendale, he also dressed up as a beggar and snuck inside and rescued the king just before he was executed. While trying to get away, they were discovered and had to fight their way to the stables, get horses, and then get through the gates. Very similar. Barristan at Duskendale was wounded, but slew Sir Simon Hollard, who was House Darkland's master at arms, and was the one that killed Gwen Gaunt, the Kingsguard Knight. Normally, this would have maybe been a tough fight for Barristan, but I suspect he had some advantages that are kind of under the radar. One is that Duskendale had been low on food for a while, thanks to the siege. Not only is Barristan just a better fighter, but the guards he fought against here were likely tired, malnourished, really stressed out, like thinking that any moment now Tywin could just come and kill them all. Uh, Maybe they didn't know about that part, but regardless, they'd be in sorry shape. The one wound he took was from an arrow, so no one was able to touch him with a blade (laughs) because uh, they're all no no match for him and hungry. Uh, So he carries the wounds of this decision to this day still more so than any battle scars. He thinks of what Ares became and what he did. Some nights, Sir Barristan wondered if he had not done that duty too well. 
He had sworn his vows before the eyes of gods and men. He could not in honour go against them, but the keeping of those vows had grown hard in the last years of King Ares' reign. He had seen things that it pained him to recall, and more than once he wondered how much of the blood was on his own hands. If he had not gone into Duskendale to rescue Ares from Lord Darklin's dungeons, the king might well have died there as Tywin Lannister sacked the town. Then Prince Rhaegar would have ascended the Iron Throne, mayhaps to heal the realm. Duskendale had been his finest hour, yet the memory tasted bitter on his tongue. Like we've seen with Jamie, he wrestles with which duty is more prominent. How do you set one oath above the other? And what happens when they conflict with each other? Defend the weak or defend the king? When Barristan slew Maelys the Monstrous, there's no moral conflict there. He was a usurper with no just cause, and he was a cruel man. But, but then Barristan wasn't a king's guard either. He was an up-and-coming knight. At Duskendale, Barristan performed an equally or even more legendary feat to save the king, to honor the cloak he earned by slaying Maelys. Killing Maelys saved thousands of lives. Full stop. No debate. It's very clear. Saving Ares, though, may have done the opposite. Because killing Maelys ended the war instantly. That's it. It's just done. War's over. But had Ares been killed, maybe Robert's Rebellion never happens. That's a lot of bodies that never hit the floor. It's not as direct as killing Maelys to end the war, but it's almost as certain when you put it all together and suss it out. The immediate fallout is simple enough. Lord Darklin, without a hostage, has no choice, really. He's got to surrender and beg for mercy. Just hope it works out. It didn't. Ares reacted as predicted, with vindictiveness as haphazard as it is extreme. Everyone with the name Darklin or Hollard was put to death. The town of Duskendale itself was spared, but the Hollard lands were wiped out. Even their villages put to the torch. Ares was crueler to the Hollards than he was to the Darklands, and like we said earlier, he saved the worst for Lady Sorala. She was maimed horribly, then burned alive. What's particularly interesting here is how much this reflects what appears to be coming for Barristan in Marine. With Danny missing, he and Skahaz Mokandak are running the city. Skahaz, that's the shave pate, very much wants blood. He's, he wants to wipe out the slaver families because... He not only believes it to be the only way for his culture to move forward away from their old ways, but also he knows these slaver families really well, well enough to know that they will, they will inflict the same brutalities on him if they ever regain the upper hand. And he may not be willing to give them the chance to regain that upper hand. He may kill them while Barristan's in the field. That's a theory that I like that's, that's out there. If so, Barristan will wrestle with himself at the conflict that he's caused by maybe enabling another slaughter through his decisions. Between Skahaz, Daenerys, Aegon VI, John Connington, all these others, even setting aside the question of who is the rightful heir, there are numerous slaughters, burnings, and other horrible fates waiting for enemy combatants and innocents alike in the rest of the story, even if we just keep it around what Barristan's going to be involved with. If he doesn't die first, some part of him may wish he had, as no matter what choice he makes, he's going to face doubts as to whether he chose correctly. One suggestion given us about Barrison's character comes from his sparing of Dantos. Dantos was a squire and a child at the time. About that, there's several things Barrison values highly. Knighthood, childhood, noble blood. He's one of the folks that believes noble blood is superior. He has that bias. So wiping out families makes other Westerosi nobles uncomfortable. It's a big deal. Barristan may have felt responsible for this. Had he not saved Ares, Dantos would not have faced execution at all. And though arguably so much more harm was done in the long term, in the short term, at least right away, it looked like Barristan had saved Duskendale since they were about to get sacked and avoided that. But instead, the Hollard lands were sacked. <sighs> So yeah, Tywin would have sacked the town and perhaps ex exacted severe concessions from the Hollards and the Darklands. Severe ones, very severe ones probably. But even he probably wouldn't have wiped out the whole family. And I really don't think he would have executed Dantos. And of course, I'm not exactly a Tywin defender, but even he, I don't think, executes children except in extreme cases. He will do it. He's just, he's not, uh, not likely to do it this time. 
Let's not forget the catalyst for Robert's Rebellion either. It was a similar kind of guilt by kinship mass execution thing of the sort that occurred here with the Darklands and Hollards. After executing Brandon and Rickard Stark and a bunch of other noble sons, John Aaron was ordered to, ref- to carry out Ares' execution of Ned and Robert, which he refused to do, and the rebellion was on. They'd had enough of all that. That man, the man that John Aaron stood up to, that version of the Mad King, is the portrayal that we're given first when we read A Song of Ice and Fire. That's the version of him we're introduced to and the version we know best. That's the man that sparked the rebellion. The earlier parts of his reign are known, but less important and less relevant. So that person that we know, the one we're introduced to, is very much so because of Duskendale. Captivity at Duskendale had shattered whatever sanity had remained to Ares II Targaryen. From that day forth, the king's madness reigned unchecked, growing worse with every passing year. The Darklands had dared laid hands upon his person, shoving him roughly, stripping him of his royal raiment, even daring to strike him. After his release, King Ares would no longer allow himself to be touched, even by his own servants. Uncut and unwashed, his hair grew ever longer and more tangled, whilst his fingernails lengthened and thickened into grotesque yellow talons. He forbade any blade in his presence, and save the swords carried by the knights of his king's guard sworn to protect him. His judgments became ever harsher and crueler. I wonder if Barristan's rescue was almost like a form of reverse trauma for Ares. He was trapped and desperate, abused and underfed, maybe. He may know they're thinking of killing him, only to be saved in extremely unlikely fashion. He probably didn't see that coming. This may have explained why Ares was so paranoid with everyone except his king's guard going forward, if he associated them all with the type of heroics Barristan just performed. Of course, that sort of association doesn't make a lot of sense, but we just went over how Ares was all about making extreme leaps when it comes to guilt by association, so why not heroism by association? He also used the king's guard as a weapon against Tywin later, not via swords, but via membership. He took Jamie as one of his own, so he thought. Since Jamie slew Ares, so it didn't work out. But what a wonderfully rich parallel that ends up becoming. When Tywin was rushing to King's Landing after Rhaegar's death on the Trident, he feared for Jamie's life, right? His son was effectively trapped as a hostage by duty at the Red Keep and could be a victim of Ares's quite well-documented vindictiveness. This is a complete reversal of the fear he did not feel for Ares' life at Duskendale. In both cases, he shows up at the gates ostensibly as an ally to the crown, but it's not clear what side he's really on. In both cases, Tywin would rather Ares die. He did not get his wish at Duskendale thanks to Selmy. Careful what you wish for, though. Again, a king's guard squashed expectations, even though Ares was killed, it wasn't the way he hoped for. Because now his son is the Kingslayer. Again, a Kingsguard knight kind of screws up the plan. And well, still, if Jamie hadn't done that, then well, wildfire. Once safely returned to King's Landing, His Grace refused to leave the Red Keep for any cause and remained a virtual prisoner in his own castle for the next four years, during which time he grew ever more wary of those around him, Tywin Lannister in particular. His suspicions extended even to his own son and heir. Prince Rhaegar, he was convinced, had conspired with Tywin Lannister to have him slain at Duskendale. They had planned to storm the town walls so that Lord Darklyn would put him to death, opening the way for Rhaegar to mount the Iron Throne and marry Lord Tywin's daughter. Given everything we've said here, Ares wasn't wrong. He may have been paranoid, but a lot of people really did want him dead. (laughs) And this did look bad. Tywin really was planning on sacking the town and forcing Lord Darklyn's hand. He was not making Ares' safety the primary goal, although I bet he claimed otherwise afterwards. If he really said, we have a better king right here and pointed at Rhaegar in front of the small council and other witnesses, Ares would hear about that afterwards. And Ares was known for getting big ideas and then forgetting them. But this one he followed up on. 
Paranoia was a great motivator for him. This is what immediately led to the hiring of Varus. Now, it's an open question how he found out Varus existed. How was this acquaintance made initially? It's said that he heard of Varus's talents, but maybe Varus's talents were put in front of him so he would be sure to notice them, right? Mm, this may not have been such happenstance. Either way, it's something that we don't have an answer for. Very interesting, though. It's also entirely possible that Varus and Illyrio saw the weakness of Ares's mind and the instability of his reign as an opportunity. And perhaps the rift between the crown and house Lannister was something they noticed from overseas. And, well, after all, even Lord Darklin is cited to have noticed that rift and tried to capitalize on it. He may not have been the only one. Someone else may have tried to capitalize on their capitalizing. Because if you want to get extremely conspiratorial, consider that Varus has deep connections to Mir, where he lived after he was made a eunuch, and Lady Sorella is of Mir herself. Ah, it's just two people from the same city, so we shouldn't read too much into that, but it's not something we can dismiss either. And personally, I'm of the opinion that Varus advised or worked with Lady Taina Merriweather, also of Mir. So it, it could be a parallel. Either way, because uh, Lady Tana has manipulated Cersei, just as Lady Sorala is portrayed by some as manipulating Lord Darklin. So, hey, could be. Now, have you ever wondered why Ares allowed Rhaegar to marry Elia Martell despite his dislike of the Dornish? Well, this is why. It was probably Varys' idea to have Rhaegar get married because, hey, Captain Obvious, if you're worried about a Rhaegar Cersei scheming from behind the scenes, well, just get Rhaegar married and then he can't marry Cersei. That just closes that door seemingly forever, or at least until one of them dies. And let's not forget it didn't start with Elia Martell. She was plan B. It started with Stefan Baratheon going on a bride search across the nine free cities for someone of Valyrian blood. That, of course, resulted in his death at sea, though he had come back empty-handed in the bride department too, which is kind of suspicious, honestly, to me and to a lot of you which means it was probably suspicious to Ares too because he was suspicious about everything. <laughs> Ares wasn't clear on whose side Tywin was at on Duskendale, nor was he sure whose side he was on at King's Landing before the sack, as we said. But one man was certain about the latter. Varys, right? He was emphatic to not let Tywin's army in. And of course, he wasn't there at Duskendale to offer any advice at all. He was hired after. For this, to sniff out threats, to get a handle on who could be trusted. Specifically, Ares was concerned about what Tywin and Rhaegar were up to. Yet when his life hinged on that advice, on knowing which side Tywin was on, when Tywin's loyalty hung in the balance, he went against the advice of Varys. But hey, again, Mad King, not Rational King. A few years or so prior to the rebellion, Ares' obsession with dragons grew. Never forget he was a witness to Summerhall as a teenager and saw much of his family die there while his son was also born. That had to leave an impression on his psyche of some kind. And as Ares' grip on reality lessened over the years, his memories of that trauma might drift. He might have false memories, false associations, expanded conception of it all. Who knows? Now, Aegon the Unlikely, the king behind Summer Hall, was his grandfather. His dreams told him the dragons would return, as many a Targaryens before him had similar dreams. For Aegon the Unlikely, the political situation was not great, which he was not well loved by the lords. That could be seen somewhat similarly here. Uh, except Ares maybe wasn't as popular with the commoners, but both Aegon the Unlikely and Ares II were unpopular with the lords, but for different reasons, but still. Tywin Lannister undid many of the reforms instituted by Ares' grandfather because the lords hated them at the time and afterwards. So like I said, Ares was also not beloved by the lords and his grip on power was a bit weak too because he didn't have their backing. Aegon V felt that if he had dragons, well, his lords would back him a lot more and certainly not balk at his reforms. And this solution apparently appealed to Ares as well. So he tried to have eggs hatched. It was nothing like the effort his grandfather went through, and it never amounted to anything. It didn't 
kill anyone. <laughs> and no one was at least burned to death. Well, Ares had plenty of people burned to death, but not while trying to hatch eggs. It didn't end with those efforts either. Remember how Ares' death went. Or what he thought was going to be his death. He thought detonating King's Landing with wildfire would turn him into a dragon. The notion that the Mad King immolating himself would have this effect is more than outlandish, but less so to readers than characters in world, right? We know what happened with Daenerys. We saw that. Well, we read that or saw it both. And it's pretty similar to what the Mad King tried to do. She didn't literally become a dragon, but she did immolate herself and survive the fire and emerge from it stronger. So it's similar. Dream conception similar. So we must surely consider that Ares, like so many other Targaryens, had dragon dreams too. Quite possibly he dreamt of Daenerys' pyre, but imagined it was him. This is too large an idea to fully discuss here, but Duskendale very likely plays a role. After all, we've explained in a number of ways how Ares' mental state worsened after Duskendale. We're told he suffered in captivity, and it's easy enough to leave it at that. But consider that Danny's dreams peaked when she was in pain. Well, her dragon dreams were at their most potent when she was recovering from losing Rago. Bran's dreams were never so strong as when he was in a coma. Bloodraven tells him that this is often the case, that powers are often awakened or at least heightened during traumatic events, including major sickness. Jojen Reed's green dream started not at birth, but after a bout of gray water fever. Lots of examples here. So we must consider that Ares' dreams may too have peaked, or at least been more potent and vivid than usual during his long stay in the dungeons of the Dunfort, with no distractions, no pleasures, the stuff, the day-to-day life he was used to would all be gone, nothing but being alone with his thoughts. A major piece of evidence for this is that Ares' efforts to hatch dragons and his interest in wildfire come right after Duskendale. It's not just the political situation, but the things that he turned over in his mind while he was there that he wanted to act on when he got the chance of freedom again. It will go better for Daenerys, optics-wise, if rather than being perceived as the Mad King's daughter, people see her as Rhaegar's sister. If she won't marry Aegon VI, then Varys will turn on her. He will smear her as he's smeared anyone else that's not on their side, doing whatever damage he can to their reputation. In her case, it's a pretty straightforward thing to do. Just make sure everyone associates her with the Mad King while making sure to associate his candidate for the throne with Rhaegar, who was beloved. So, yeah. Basically, it's the same thing they were planning to do with her brother, Viserys, which is use him as the fall guy. This is where we actually feel a little bit of sympathy for Viserys. He was born just a year before Duskendale. That means his very earliest years of childhood correspond with Ares' worst years. So let that sink in. The Mad King at his maddest was the only experience Viserys had with him as a father figure. All his fathering was post-Duskendale Ares. Oof, that's a bad father figure. So when Viserys yells, don't wake the dragon, and has all these bizarre delusions of grandeur and his barely concealed mix of rage and sadness, this is almost certainly a result of his father's influence combined with probably a larger than normal dose of Targaryen genetic mental instability. But maybe it was all upbringing. We think nature versus nurture, and well, nurture is hard to have much worse than that in terms of influence. Obviously, he didn't, you know, suffer in terms of having food, things like that. But that, yeah, you can see why I feel a little bit of sympathy for him. When Viserys was barely old enough to walk, he was already seeing his father's brand of ruling, his father's brand of quote-unquote justice. He was raised on paranoia, brutality, and vindictiveness. He was taught through his father's actions that disagreement is disloyalty, that dissent is treason, similar things that Tyrion says about how Cersei rules. This may have been a part of why Viserys was so stunned to see the Dothraki begin to love and respect Daenerys while growing more and more contemptuous of him. This was world-changing for him. Thanks to his upbringing, he thought kings and queens shouldn't have to earn respect or love, rather that they deserve it as their due. And he had never really seen what loving a king looked like. A respected king or queen didn't exist really that much in his lifetime. Even the usurper 
people liked Robert at first after his win, but Robert was kind of like, ah, this guy's not good of a king after all. So even his enemy wasn't exactly a portrayal of a good king. This is something he never saw. Viserys grew up without seeing any good leadership at all, pretty much, let alone all this other stuff. This leads to him trying to steal her dragon's eggs, which is a notable symbol of their heritage that was hers, not his. Additionally, his prejudiced rejection of Dothraki is similar enough to his father's rejection of the Dornish, which was also pretty racist. In both cases, they're insulting their own in-laws, though, who happen to be important allies. Like, this is dumb. <laughs> but you can see where he got it from, though. This was his father figure. He learned all these things from the Mad King. So let's blame Barristan for that too, right? It's Barristan's fault that Viserys came out that way. Not really. In an episode where we've highlighted a lot of ironies and unintended consequences like that one, there's one more that deserves mention. The Knight of the King's Guard's prime directive, as we've been over many times in this episode, is to protect the life of the king. It's number one. Now, how could Barristan know, though, that the young life he spared in Dantos would grow up to kill the king? <laughs> To be clear, Sir Dantos was in it for the gold that Littlefinger promised him, but maybe he saw it as an added bonus that he was helping kill the king that just kicked his personal savior out of the king's guard. Dantos would be too cowardly to say so at the time or ever, but he'd have surely disagreed with Joffrey and Cersei at kicking Barrison out like that and embarrassing him. You're like, that's the guy that saved my life. You shouldn't treat him like that, he says internally. Dantos never even told Sansa that she was the second person to save his life. With Kingsguard all around him, Dantos was almost put to death. Joffrey, too, was surrounded by Kingsguard when he drank deep of the Strangler. Parallels within parallels. Duskin Dale is still there, though it was hit hard by the War of Five Kings thanks to Roose Bolton using it as a trap to undermine Rob's loyal men. He ordered a large portion of the King of the North's army to attack Duskin Dale and the surrounding area allowing Randall Tarly and Gregor Clegane to swoop in and trap them against the sea, effectively destroying the army. Again, Duskendale suffered thanks to the machinations of greater powers. Of course, it is not the Darklands or Hollards leading the recovery since they're all gone. It is now ruled by House Riker. Surely thanks to Ares, who would have given it away right after he handed out all those executions. And we've heard little from the Rikers in general. One exception is Sir Jeremy Riker, killed by a white not long after becoming the interim replacement for Benjen Stark, his first ranger. Sir Jeremy fought for Ares in Robert's Rebellion. We don't know what happened to the rest of his family other than that they still have Duskendale. Funny thing, recall, if you will, the anecdote of young Tywin Lannister and the mocking he received at table one day when a lord suggested Tywin's chamber pot be mined for gold. Tywin stared down this lord like an alternate universe Martell, unflinching, unblinking, unwavering. His target was anything but, gradually wilting under his gaze. He became flustered, and Lord Riker left the hall. Look out for a companion episode to this on Cersei. The Defiance of Cersei shares an enormous number of parallels with the Defiance of Duskendale. Just think about how she marched into a place to negotiate and was taken prisoner and held. Hmm, yes, very similar. But the similarities don't end there because as many of you well know, the Mad King and Cersei have a lot in common besides that. We will also be having a discussion episode, most likely uh, non-scripted, with Joe Magician is the plan to talk about Ares' dreams in greater detail and other dragon dreamers as well. Thanks to Mikhail Schick for the wonderful quote work. She is Ink as Rain. On Twitter, she is also part of the Vassals of Kingsgrave podcast and the podcast of Surprise. That's a Witcher podcast that includes me and Kyle Foster as well. Thanks to Zach Louie for the section headers. Check his show out, Game of Owns. I'm sure you've heard of it by now, but maybe you haven't checked it out. You should. Thanks to Nina Friel for some writing help here with this one. Check her out at goodqueenalley.tumblr.com. That's one L in alley. Thanks to Michael Klarfeld, of course for the maps, the video intro, and so much more. You can find him at claradocs.de. Shea, as always, is responsible for so much behind the scenes, production, recording, video, and audio editing, and many other things. The audio engineering is by our Benjineer. The podcast editing is by me. Also want to shout out Dancing Sean. His new channel is on YouTube. He started off by discussing The Boys. By the time you hear this, he may have moved on to another show. Like The Boys, it's a great place to start and keep up with what Sean's doing. 
Shout out to all the many artists who contributed work to this episode. We have such a wonderful community of artists around A Song of Ice and Fire. You'll find names in the credits and on the art itself. We remember Lord Mark of House Joseph, the Snow in Winterfell, rider of Mazalacartho, the white dragon with green scales, horns, wings, and talons. The mysterious BR is Hand of the King. Lord Stephen Stark, titles, titles. Hand of Queen Ashea, who is known as the best. Lord Jim the Fortuitous of Wars and Politics of Ice and Fire is Warden of the West. Lord George Stormsville the Cunning is Lord of the Chiliad and Warden of the East. Cabeth the Unfrozen is Lord of the Bricks and Castle Crimson Light, Defender of the Old Gods and Warden of the North. Lord Brendan Lannister, the Bloodline, is ruler of Castle Everor, Warden of the South. Lord James Tuttle is King of the Stepstones and the Narrow Sea, commander of the Royal Fleet, consisting of the Narrow Fleet led by Flagship Caraxes and the Bloodstone Fleet led by Flagship Prince Daemon. Lord James's fleet prefers to stop at Duskendale. They prefer the smell. Jenny the Just, captain of the ghost ship Liberty, which vanished in the Shivering Sea over a century ago, but has recently been sighted near Volantis, if the tales can be believed, wouldn't know what Duskendale smells like. King Beyond the Wall, Sidney Jesse, the Fallborn, is Lord of Bluespring in the Haunted Forest, wields a dagger of dragonglass and the Valyrian steel blade Red Frost. He wants to know what Duskendale smells like, but you don't want to give him the chance. White Walker patron Araya Flint of the Mountain Flints was captured by the Weeper only to be raised in the Valley of Milkwater. Blue eyes and golden memories. Alexander Greyblood, first of the first men now crowned in ice, called Silence Bringer, Woodblinder, and the Snow of Night, is wielder of the ice-forged greatsword, Pale Frost. Our Blood Rider patrons, including Kohol Koei, called Sun Piercer, wielder of a Dragonbone Bow, and Kakavo the Tamer, wielder of the Wildfire Whip Gehenna. From the depths of Flea Bottom, Lord Ken of House Hammer has declared for Queen Kerry, Fire of the North, who recovered Dark Sister from beyond the wall, and a laurel of glory in the name of love, to Bud of House Beresford, Knight of Tokian and Arbiter of Scotch from Sandy the Dragon, Blood of Queen Daenerys, and Lady of Jameson. Our Ironborn captains include Black Matto Stormrider, Captain of the Rusted Hinge, Lord Chucklaw is Captain of the Droma Nightblood, Destroyer of Evil, John Gregor is Captain of the Fist of the Drowned God, Sir Kiron of Lonely Light is Scourge of the Sunset Sea, Captain of Naga's Breath, a Droman armed with siphons of wildfire. Aileen is Archer Queen, Captain of the Border Collie. Crimson Kate is Captain of the Drowned Queen's Vengeance. Jasana the Just is Collector of Tolls, Captain of the Golden Gift. Check out Beneath the Gold, a podcast focusing on lesser known A Song of Ice and Fire characters. Prakash, the Lord Protector of the Gallifreyans, is Captain of Tardis of the Seven Seas. Tempest of House Brewer is Captain of the Summer Storm. And last but not least, Catherine the Cruel is Captain of the Kraken's Claw. Our small council includes Lord Benjen of House Hornwood, Master of Laws, Laura Boros, the Lady of Infinity, Master of Coin, and Bloody Ben Blackwood, Master of Whispers. Our lords and ladies in their castles include Lady Dyerliz of Castle Naki, the Alpha Patron, Lord Dan of the Red Mountains and Castle Great Bell, Breaker of the Second Stone, Gregor the Toasty, Lord of the Breadfort, Ashlyn Winter, the Hawk's Eye, Lady of Castle Skyfall, the Lord of the Halls of Castle Hillcrest is Wielder of the Valyrian Steel Machete Everglazed, Lord Bemmy Snugglebunny is Guardian Ranger of the Hidden Hundred Acre Werewood, Dual Wielder of Valyrian Short Swords, Glorious Morning, and Little Light Wise, Sharpshooter of the Werewood and Ironwood, Laminated Longbow Todd Von Oben. When you fear things cannot get worse, Snugglebunny enters the fray. The Bastard of the Wolfswood is First Forester of the Old Gods, sworn to House Ironwearwood. Listen for the silence. Casey Stark is of House Acres. Lady Dillsdale is the Star Spear of Crescent Hill, Mistress of the Dornish Marches. Peter Rivers is the Pale Dragon and heir to Bloodraven. Lady Carlin Carey of Castle Stonesharp, whose horse is shod in Valyrian steel, is Lady Rider of the Rising Hills. Lady Mora of House Stark is Archmistress of Apothecaries and Woodswitch. Her castle features werewood doors with painted moons. Our King's Justice is Sir Troy the Steady, wielder of the Valyrian Steel Blade Fate. The Queen's High Council has Rabea Star Eyes, Lady of Waves and Mistress of Ships, Captain of the Iron Shadow Cat. In the shadows we bear our claws. Grand Archmaester Rennie, whose rod and ring and mask are quartz crystal, wielder of the Valyrian steel pen, fire and ink. Lady Tracy the Ascendant, ruler of the Cloud Keep, master of laws. The purple Lord Leo Anansi, master of whisperers. Our King's Guard is led by Lord Commander Namian of House Darkland, the Night Slayer, wielding the Valyrian sword Onyx Abyss. He's backed by Sir Dean the White, Knight of the Black Star. Gregor Snow called Snowbear, O Bastard of Winterfell. Vaughn of House Furster. Their sigil is a mailed fist with extended forefinger and pinky on light blue field. Visenya let us hold Dark Sister once. Sir Bateman, the Dark Knight. 
Sir Roland de Stark, gunslinger knight of the Winter Kings, back from a 20-year ranging to the lands of Always Winter to protect my King Aziz. Well, thanks. The Queen's Guard has Lord Captain Commander Hema Helminth, the Sellsword Sentinel, Sir Rambo, Knight of House Ganon, First Blood, Amber the Adamant, the Knight of the Mist and Mother of Squids, the Wintry Wolverine, we finish what you begin, Nora Nico, and Archmaester Vena, whose ring, rod, and mask are made of steel, not pudding. Our beard guard is led by Lord Commander George the Golden, backed by Lady Rita of the Coppermane, the Unbound, Dance the Fervor, and Sir Jeff, Warden of the AC, Wielder of Triad, the multifaceted beard of platinum, red and brown. Stay frosty. And last but not least, the members of the History of Westeros Night's Watch. Lord Commander Richard the Ligerheart, wielder of Barry's Ankle Breaker, a flail with blue and silver valyrian steel spikes. His motto is Go Blue. Backed by first builder Magor Snow, a.k.a. Magor the Cool, the Fire in the Snow, first ranger Liam, a.k.a. Sir Waiting on a Nickname, and first steward Sir Jurian of the Torrentine, called Pale Wind. We hope we didn't miss your shout-out. If we did, please let us know, and we'll make sure it gets included going forward. Patreon is the most popular way to support History of Westeros. Go to patreon.com slash historyofwesteros to learn more. Or if you prefer, go to historyofwesteros.com, and there's lots of other ways to support the show apart from Patreon. And that does it for this episode of History of Westeros podcast. Thanks, everybody. Until next time, Valar Reredus.